I just click the record button. button. So now everything I say is going to be recorded. And uh, this recording will be posted on the San Gorgonio chapter YouTube channel. And it will be up within 24 hours. Sometimes if I'm uh, not sleepy, I'll, I'll, I would do it tonight. Uh, otherwise, I'll do it tomorrow. And uh, everybody who got an email reminder, I sent in that reminder the link to the San Gregorio Chapter YouTube channel. So uh, you just click on that link. You can look at past Trail Talk uh, presentations and this one as well after 24 hours after I get it on. So I think I've covered most everything I need to cover about the rules. And so I'm going to remove my stop uh, spotlight. And uh, Julianne, uh, you're next. Oh, thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Julianne Anderson. Uh, I'm an outings leader with the San Gregorio chapter of the Sierra Club. And uh, along with uh, John St. Clair and Carla Kellums, we constitute the Trail Talk Committee, the informal committee that, that produced these monthly talks. And we are absolutely delighted to have our own uh, Norman Bossom uh, present uh, his history of Wrightwood's Bighorn Mine. And I'd like to introduce you uh, properly to Norman. Uh, Norman was born in West London. He's a Brit. Uh, in 1968, uh, Norman joined the Thames Valley Police and retired in 1991 with the rank of Detective Sergeant. And uh, as an aside, uh, Norman and I were just chatting this evening. Uh, I don't know if many of you watch PBS, but uh, there's some uh, mystery programs over the weekend. Uh, one of them, I think, is Midsummer Murders. And Norm said he worked in that area. If you watch that show, he worked there. Also, Endeavor, which is in the city of Oxford in, in the UK, Norm worked there also as a policeman, as a detective. Um, so Norm retired in 1991 with the rank of Detective Sergeant, Drug Squad. He started a private investigation business and later came to the United States in 1995, settling in the high desert here in California, in Southern California. Norm worked at a local continuation high school as a campus assistant until retirement in 2015. Uh, Norm's been a member of the Sierra Club for 10 years and an outings leader for eight years. Uh, he has a passion for the desert and mountains, which includes the local history. Norman is a member of the Mojave Historical Society. So I think you're going to find this talk fascinating. Norm has done a beautiful job. Um, and as a, as a history buff and a, and a history major myself, uh, I, I just find this fascinating. So Norm, thank you so much for agreeing to present and take it away. Excellent, thank you very much, appreciate it. And good evening to everybody. Um, really, this is the story of the man who discovered the mine um, and his story is really, really fascinating, uh, far more fascinating than a, a mine. Um, one of the things that I have learned is that when it comes down to history, even though this is fairly recent history, that quite often um, there are conflicting stories. Um, so if you know anything about uh, Tom Vincent, the guy who discovered the mine, or you know anything about the mine, um, Rest assured, I understand that it might conflict with what I say. Um, but uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, you try to add it all up and work it out and uh, give the best side of it that is possible. Um, but there are always varying stories. Um, so the first part of the, uh, this uh, presentation is about um, Charles Tom Vincent. So we call him Tom. Uh, because that's apparently uh, what he, uh, how people knew him. Um, the Bighorn Mine, um, I'm sure uh, when you've seen the photographs and listened to the story, you'll probably want to go there. I, I know that a lot of people do go there. Um, if you go through Wrightwood uh, on Highway 2 and you go for about eight miles until you go down a fairly steep um, slope, uh, into Vincent Gap, which is a very, very large parking lot. 
And on the right, you'll see um, the, um, uh, the mountain that um, was um, that uh, the mine is in. And you will um, find that uh, if you park up, you go to the left to find Tom Vincent's cabin and to find the mine. So Tom Vincent, he was born in 1938 in Ohio. Then we have him in 1863 and he's in the 8th Ohio Regiment. Um, and he was at the uh, Battle of Gettysburg where he was in fact wounded. Um, after the Civil War, uh, he moved to Arizona with a pal of his called Lockwood, who we believe was in the army with him. So they were probably trusted. And bearing in mind that the um, 8th Ohio Regiment was not only at Gettysburg, but prior to that, they were in other big battles as well. And you know that as, as they were infantry, they, were, they lost a lot of bodies. It was, must have been pretty horrific for him. Um, and perhaps that shows that in the, in the uh, future, he was very antisocial. So probably had um, PTSD, but of course they didn't know about it then, did they? Um, so, and after he left Arizona and after 1868, he was prospecting in the Sierras and in Death Valley, and he ended up in LA. And sometime in the probably early 1870s, he wandered into the San Gabriel Mountains. And we will now go to the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, on the right is, as you look at the screen, um, that's Mount Baden Powell, where the Big Horn Mine is situated. At that time, it certainly wasn't known as Mount Baden Powell. It was not renamed until the early 1830s after the uh, guy who um, founded the Scouts all over the world, Lord Baden Powell. So we know that there was definitely activity there. Um, and the mountain is 9,400 feet tall. The Pacific Crest Trail uh, actually runs straight over the top of it. It's, um, it's a four mile hike and you're gonna have to go up 3,300 feet to get to the summit. I have done it and believe me, it's even tougher going down. So what I want you to do is take a look at this and we we'll show a slightly different view of it. It's the wilderness, it's still the wilderness. And at the time that Tom Vincent wandered in there in the uh, 1870s, it was uh, even wilder than we see it here. If you look at the uh, top of the mountain on the right, you can see the saddle and that is actually the summit. And if you come down the tree line, you can just see the scarring of a trail going round. Um, and that's, that goes round to the Bighorn Mine. The Bighorn Mine is 7,000 feet above sea level. So it's pretty, pretty high up there. Anyway, so we've got Tom and he's gone into uh, this area. Um, and because he was very reclusive, although he did have one or two friends, rather surprisingly, the, uh, there was a, a report that he and a guy called Delancey, it might have been Delaney, but they, they say it's Delancey. Uh, in 1888, they were attacked by three grizzlies. Tom shot two of them with his Remington 50 caliber rifle. The third jumped on him and he stabbed his grizzly bear in the neck. And Delancey came up and shot the bear in the head from point blank range. And Tom had minor injuries. So if you bear in mind that uh, it was the wilderness and up until the early part of the, or the late part of the 1800s, early 1900s, there were grizzly bears in the area. So you've got grizzlies, you've got mountain lions, bobcats. Um, so it was a, a, an extremely wild place uh, for anyone to live. And uh, that's what he was doing was uh, eking out an existence there. Um, there was also a report that he, at one time, he killed five deer with six shots. So I guess he's eaten bear and deer most of the time then. Um, in 1891, Tom was out hunting bighorn sheep 
when he discovered the mine. Um, and how did he discover the mine? He would have seen um, it, it would be quartz with um, iron in it. So it's a whitish solid rock, very hard rock. And the, you would have the, um, the areas where the uh, iron was going through it. Good sign that there's gonna be some metal there that would be worth something. And as he was an experienced miner, he immediately spotted this. And with his friend Lockwood, um, with a guy called Shippy, they staked the mine. So that's 1891. Um, he and his pals went in 300 feet. That was the first tunnel that went in. So if you can imagine, it must have been really, really difficult getting in there to get all this um, ore out. And then they got to crush it then they've got to wash it out to get the gold out of it, because that is what they were predominantly mining was gold. Um, and it must have been extremely hard, extremely hard. Well, in 1898, he sold the mine, obviously realizing it was too difficult, sold the mine. Um, and they actually were, they were the three workers at the mine. That was Tom Delancey and, um, Lockwood, sorry, Lockwood Shippy, Lockwood and Shippy. Um, and in 1901, the mine was sold to a guy called Colonel Fenner, who is pretty well known in the uh, um, Wrightwood area. Um, and this was, um, when I go into the history of the mine, this was the halcyon day of the mine. This is when they were really, it, it got really busy after 1901. Um, and in 1914, Dorothy Evans Noble, the postmistress at Valley Irma, the nearest town, um, and a rancher called Bob Pallet, visited Tom at his cabin. And there's his cabin. Um, and she described him as a thin old man in blue jeans with a barrel chest, blue eyes, white eyebrows, and a white beard. Now, if you go to check out the mine now, that's what you're gonna see. And that is, it's some of the old wood that was uh, used in the original cabin is still was used in it, but this was actually, um, it is a, a, a remake by the uh, Forest Service. And you can tell when you start to look at the, the three areas on the roof, and then you see the ones here, you can see that it's totally different. There's another photograph of the mine, um, sorry, of the cabin. And again, you can see the three sections of roofing and um, it, it doesn't have the shingles. And in the same photo is this, there is Tom Vincent and there is his 50 caliber rifle. Okay, there's a, a whole story behind this. It was taken in 1917 by a guy called Bill Bristol, William Bristol. At the time, Tom would have been 78 or 79 years. Well, Bill Bristol had moved to the Wrightwood area and he took a photographer up to see uh, Tom because he'd befriended him. And the next thing that happened, he said, look, I've got a guy here who's come to take a photograph of your cabin and the guy actually took a photograph of the cabin and Tom Vincent. I'm sure Tom wouldn't have the faintest idea of what the camera really was as he was so reclusive. And um, but, so after 1917 we go on to 1926 and Tom walked into an LA hospital and a um, long way from Wrightwood. And he, uh, they, they put him in a bed and he told the doctor his story. And his story was this, his real name was Charles Vincent Doherty. There's a good Irish name for you. Um, and he believed that he was wanted because he and Lockwood had shot three men who were ransacking their cabin in Arizona when they were out prospecting. So that's the reason uh, he left Arizona in 1868. Um, and as he said, he believed that he was wanted. And as it turned out, the law in Arizona was that if you were 
claim jumping and I guess going through uh, a miner's cabin, probably looking for gold, because I don't think they'd be looking for cans of beans, um, would probably be claim jumping. And so they would not have been prosecuted. And he said his wish was to uh, be buried with fellow veterans in a, an army cemetery. And very shortly after, well, the story says he died the next day, but I suspect it probably was two or three days. Um, and bearing in mind that this 87, 88 year old man had walked from Wrightwood into LA. That's a, a pretty colossal undertaking, but apparently he did it. Um, horses in his life have never been mentioned. Anyway, September the 18th, uh, 1926, age 87, 88, he died. And fortunately, um, we found his gravestone. He was buried at the Soldiers Cemetery. It's called the LA National Cemetery. Section nine, row G, grave 22. Now you can see that the name on there is Vincent Doherty, but his real name was Charles Vincent Doherty. It's got the 8th Ohio Infantry. We can't make out what it says in the middle. At one point, I actually thought it had to be the number of the grave to identify it, but it's, it's just too difficult to make out. Tom Vincent. Vincent Gap is named after him. So if you go there, you'll park in Vincent Gap in the parking lot. There's a Vincent Hill and there's a Vincent Gulch. And of course, there is the Bighorn Mine, which he named. So it's a fairly, fairly impressive legacy. Um, kudos to Tom Vincent, absolutely unbelievable story. And bearing in mind that he would have led the roughest life that you can imagine up there. And the winters in Brightwood then, and to an extent now, are pretty severe. What was interesting was that 18, sorry, yeah, 1838, when Tom was born in Ohio, it was the same year that John Muir was born into, in Scotland. And as we know, John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, came to America when he was 11. And that was because of poverty as well. And in 1877, there was a visitor to the San Gabriels. He had no firearms. He had three loaves of bread, a pound of tea, sorry, a pound and a half of tea. And um, he was wandering the area. Don't know that he ever came across Tom Vincent. Um, doubt it somehow. Um, but there he was. John Muir was, came through Wrightwood at the time that um, Tom Vincent was there. So that's the part of Tom Vincent. Now we move on to the Bighorn Mine. One of the things I've discovered here is that, as is always the case, there's a whole stack of dates and a whole stack of facts. So what I propose to do is obviously give the dates, but really and truthfully, um, much of the information that's involved in it is, um, is, is it, I don't want it to say it's boring because to some people it won't be. There are two things I will point out. I'm not a geologist, don't know much about it. I'm not a mining engineer, don't know that much about it. Every time I go to a mine, there are always more questions than answers. Um, and all, it doesn't matter about all the stuff I've read. It's just really, really quite, uh, it, it's quite complicated. One thing to understand, these people with their minds, they never put anything in or around a mine that wasn't um, there to make profit. They are not going to be putting stuff in there for no reason because it required an enormous amount of investment. And as you'll see, there's been an enormous amount of investment in the uh, Bighorn mine. Um, and I don't really think that what they got out of it covered it, but that's not uncommon with uh, particularly gold mining. So in 1891, the gold was discovered by Tom Vincent. And as we said, he sold the mine and, uh, in 1898 and his three pals, uh, Shippy Lockwood and he, um, they, uh, they sold 
this hard rock mine. Um, the people that took it on just employed the three of them to keep digging it out. And so it really didn't go anywhere because you need machinery in there to crush the ore and uh, you really need to get it going. And so it's gonna require a lot of uh, manual labor. So in 1901, Colonel Fenner purchased the mine and there was the 300 foot tunnel as we remember. And they added um, at least a 1200 foot cross cut and this supply road, which is how you'll walk up there, um, was actually built. And it goes for two and a half miles, probably goes further into Valley Yerma, which would be about five miles in total, maybe six. And as you can see, there is elevation. Um, if you go from Vincent Gap to the mine, 450 feet elevation gain. Um, and as you get older, believe me, it seems like it's more than that now. So um, in June of 1903, uh, Fenner and his um, uh, corporation, they put in a, a 10 stamp mill after they'd originally built a two stamp mill. Um, and in 1905, the mill burnt down and it was repaired by September and lasted another uh, two years. And tunnels six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, were excavated, but in 1908, activity was reduced um, and it eventually stopped. It's interesting that they um, removed 15,564 tons of ore um, and they were able to get um, $38,720 worth of gold out of it. And gold was at that time, um, if, if you imagine, you, you do it in ounces, but it's how, many, uh, how much value it is when you get it out. And we're looking here at $2.25 a tonne. So they've done over 15,000 tonnes of ore and they're only getting 2.25 a tonne. But that was in, uh, in those days. So as you can imagine, um, it was, uh, it would be a lot more in this day and age, but $38,000 worth. In 1916, Colonel Fenner died and his wife became the owner. And due to litigation and all sorts of other stuff, the uh, mine was, um, was basically unused. And in 1931, it was... Um, it, sorry, it was 1934, it was leased to a Bighorn Mining Company. And this is when its uh, second resurrection came. And um, here you see, if you go up towards the mine, walking on the road, just before you get to the mine, it turns a sharp 90 degrees, and then you walk into where the mine is about three or 400 yards ahead where there's a little slope that goes down and in this slope is where they actually had these buildings because they were employing 30 men and they had an office they had 30 men so they would obviously put them up because there was nowhere else for them to stay and this is where they they would live in these these uh, buildings and if you see here there's another side a uh, shot of the buildings and over on the right at the top you can actually see Mount Baldy with snow on it there's also a gentleman standing down there as well. And these are the remnants of those buildings that are there nowadays. Uh, there's just wood and pieces of stuff everywhere. It's really, really, uh, it was a big concern. There's no question about it. What they did, they had, um, they had the office and living buildings erected. They had 15 claims and they had numerous tunnels one was over 1400 feet. They installed a 50 ton flotation plant um, and the mine area was repaired. As I said, 30 people employed. There was a power supply, they had a diesel engine. Um, and um, this, I believe, is the, uh, are the remains of the 50 ton flotation plant 
they're very close to where the buildings were, which makes sense because they would have brought the crushed ore out of the mine and put it in a flotation plant. What is a flotation plant? Well, it's um, what you you uh, it you put all the uh, um, crushed ore in it, and what it does uh, by some process, and I don't know what the process is, but they use water. What they do is wash it all out and uh, the metals that they need, they keep. Um, there's absolutely no other thing that we can see that this would be used for. So the mine was running um, and there finally is a picture of the mine as it is today. I have to thank a good friend of mine who took the photograph and then photoshopped it because he needed to get all of the uh, graffiti out of it. It's really sad to see. What's also sad to see is that the concrete and the iron that you see there is going to last for, I'm not going to say forever, but it's really solid. But of course, the wood is all falling apart and it's actually starting to get a little bit dangerous around it uh, now. So, you know, if you go there, just be really careful. And um, this is how the mine looked in 1934. And if you take a look at it, you can see the parts that are missing. It really was massive. And you can actually see that there's a road going in just to the right, whereas here, the road is actually gone now. This is another picture probably taken around 1934. This is at the back of the mine where they're putting the, the rocks into a, a crusher, the stamps to crush it. This is very interesting. I'm not talking about the graffiti either. Um, as you look at it, on the right is a boiler and on the left is a pump. And the pump is, has the initials IR on it, which is Ingersoll Rand a company that are still uh, going strong. Um, and Ingersoll Rand was actually formed um, in 1905. The Ingersoll Company and the Rand Company from New York, um, they merged in that year. Um, this, this stuff was obviously brought in, but if you can imagine, and I can tell you the boiler, this thing must weigh a ton. It is, it's really, really heavy. Um, and they would have brought that in um, uh, using wagons with horses. There was, there's never any reports of uh, any mechanical vehicles actually coming into the mine. Um, still there, good to see it there. Um, it was a shame that they just can't clear up the wood and, and show these things because it is quite difficult to climb up to it. This, is one of the uh, iron beams that the mine was, uh, the buildings were actually erected on, Jones and Laughlin. Well, Ingersoll Rand were from New York, Jones and Laughlin were actually formed in 1852. They are still going strong. They were um, actually uh, competitors of Carnegie and they come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we're looking at equipment that was probably brought in from New York and equipment that was probably brought in from Pennsylvania. And there's the actual mine. And you can see the white quartz all around. It's all close to the graffiti. Now then, very important. Um, there are numerous tunnels here and they've tried to, um, what they tried to do is map out the tunnels, but they ran into difficulties. And the difficulties they ran into were that there were cave-ins, collapses, all sorts of problems like that. One occasion I was hiking with a guy who was a, or he, he had retired, but he was actually a mine inspector. And he issued certificates, of safety certificates for mines. And um, he told me, he said, Norm, Whatever you do, never go in a mine, not unless it's got a safety certificate. He said, they are really, really dangerous places. So whenever you go up there, 
yes, the mine is barred off, but you can actually climb through the bars to get in. This photograph was taken by putting my camera through the, through the bars. And about four years ago, I was in a leader, a group through the Sierra Club to the Bighorn Mine, and it was advertised in the paper. And I got a very terse email from some lady professor from the, um, uh, from, uh, the authorities. It was a federal authority, and she was telling me, under no circumstances, Monsieur or anybody else go in that mine. And that was it. And as I said, it was really test. I do not go in mines, and I will tell you, do not go in a mine. This is a view from the, um, from the mine. And as you can see, that's Mount Baldy. And you can see that the uh, ironwork, which must have been brought it in and then all bolted together, is very, very sturdy and it will last a long time. So let's hope that um, they can just clear the wood out and perhaps do something with this place. It'd be very nice. And there's another photograph of it. Right. That's me as you face it on the right. The guy in the middle, Dan Madsen, I want to thank Dan. He took a lot of the photographs. The guy on the left is um, Tom Mitchell. Tom will go camping, sorry, not camping, hiking, and he'll do this history stuff. He's interested in it, and he's uh, given me lots of information, been very, very helpful. And uh, as, um, as we say, um, don't go out in the wilderness on your own. It's a very dangerous place. So I'm really pleased to say that Tom, if I just give him a call, he'll always come out into the wilderness with me, so I'm not out there alone. Any questions? Norm, uh, in the chat, one of our uh, viewers was asking about uh, whether there's still gold in the ground, in the mine, and also another was asking what other minerals um, have been mined there. Okay, excellent. Great questions. Well, in 1936, when the production was finished, they were getting $4 a tonne. And the total amount of uh, value of the gold that they dug out of there was probably around $100,000 after all these years. The mine has since been sold in 38, it was sold on. Um, in 1966, it was transferred to a, a Siskin Corporation. In 1981, it was sold to a company called Hanna Mining. And all of these people have just basically done nothing with it. So, as I said, it was the halcyon days of the uh, of 1903 to around 1908, and then in the uh, in the early 30s was when most of it was uh, taken out of there. There are 11,500 feet of tunnels in there that they know of. So, as you see, it was extremely busy. And to answer the question. Um, the, uh, in the San Gabriel Mountains and all the mines that are there, and there are several, they managed to pull out 5,364 ounces of gold. Well, 3,701 ounces of that gold came from the Bighorn Mines. So predominantly they were, um, they were mining gold. But what you have to remember is they'll go in there and you never know what they're going to find. And so whatever they find, they're going to start digging it because they, it's like, well, we haven't got any gold, so we might as well go for silver. Well, in the uh, San Gabriel Mountains, the total amount of silver that came out of those mountains in the other mines or, or in the mines was 2,879 ounces and 2,430 of those ounces came from the big one. So, yes, they were mining those. And the other interesting factor that I just didn't know, but it was really quite astounding to realize it. But they actually, the Bighorn mine produced 1,357 pounds, that's not ounces, pounds of copper. And there's no other copper that came out of any of the mines in, in the area. So, you know, it, it does, does show you that it was just a massive amount that was coming out of there. So that 
you understand in you know the it, it really this really surprised me because in 2006 the wilderness land trust took over the bighorn mine and surrounding area which consists of 277 acres and they transferred the ownership to the US Forest Service a year later in 2007. And it's now part of the Sheep Mountain Wilderness Area. So I guess there is some sort of protection there. But what was interesting was that the Wilderness Land Trust actually paid $2 million for that area, all 277 acres of it, so that it could be protected, wow. which is really, really quite interesting. Wow. It is estimated that there are 262,000, that's 262,000 ounces of gold still in the mountain. But what they say is that the cost to get it out doesn't make it worth it. And one of the things I read that was um, from John Robinson's book on the San Gabriel Mountains is that they describe the gold mines in the San Gabriels, which includes the Bighorn, as marginal at best when it comes to profit. So you're not going to go out there and make a fortune. That's a fact. Well, speaking of Norm, one of our viewers was asked, brought out of the Bighorn compared to other mines in the San Gabriels. I think he already answered that. Oh, yeah, I did answer that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, it, it was basically all the silver that came out of the San Gabriels, except for 400 ounces came out of the, uh, uh, the Bighorn mine. And um, there was 5,364 5, ounces of gold from all of the mines in the area, and 3,701 of those ounces came out of the Bighorn. Yeah, and of course, no other mine in the area poured out any copper so yeah it was the busy place how'd they get water up there one of our viewers is asking okay. uh, interesting one of the reasons why the uh, mountains or the the tunnels are so dangerous is you've got water coming through there's obviously a spring at the top of the mountain uh, or there could there is there could easily be several springs and if you go up there you will actually find water coming out of uh, the two areas prior to getting to the mine there's uh, what is a tunnel and there's water always coming out of there it's very cold and it is actually drinkable um, and when you get to the bighorn mine just to the side of it you'll encounter um, a spring where water is coming out so yes, they got water. One of the things that you will see in the area, you'll see lots and lots of metal pipes um, all over the place. And clearly what they were doing was they were um, actually um, bringing the water out. And if you take a look to the right of the tracks, you'll see the water pipes there, where they're bringing water out of the mine because obviously the water is dangerous because it, it will bring rock slides in, as will um, earthquakes, which of course we know we get a lot of. So yeah, that's why it's so dangerous. It's because of the movement from the earthquakes and the movement from all the water that's coming through the mountain. Another question about, the, about mining per se, any kind of smelting equipment there or did they take, did they haul it into LA? I don't know where they hauled it to, but they would have hauled it away, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And no, there, there was nothing like that there. It would have it would have cost them too much, plus the fact um, trying to haul all that equipment up there would have been really, really tough. I mean, I'm surprised they've got all the stuff up there that they do have. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's still there is because they thought, well, I'm not going to bother taking it away. Because in, in the past with mines, that's what they would do is actually ship all the stuff out and take it to another mine to save themselves money. But this lot was all left there, as you see from the pump and the, um, all, all the other stuff that's there. Um, another question for you, uh, Norm. Any 
assuming our hiatus um, due to COVID lifts this summer, any guided hikes to the Bighorn Mine planned? Yes. Immediately we're out. Um, I shall advertise it and I'll take people up there. Okay, that's good. Yeah, no question, I always do it. Um, it's, uh, it's just that for me, it's the loveliest hike in Wrightwood. The views as you walk around the mountain to go to the, um, to the mine are just absolutely spectacular. And, and I remember on one occasion, I was singing its praises and I took a group up there and when we got there, it was socked in. <laughs> 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 and you couldn't, you couldn't actually see, uh, you couldn't see anything. So we walked around to the mine but where you take the break, that's the halfway point. And um, the next thing, just like that, it all cleared. So fortunately they got to see it, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's the wilderness and the weather can change very quickly up there. And the other thing is that Tom Vincent's cabin is close by, it's worth a visit to see the way they've reconstructed it. But bear in mind, it's not the original. So fascinating, Tom. Oh, I, I did want to add um, just a tidbit from what we were discussing um, earlier this week. If anyone's interested in sort of Civil War history in the inland, um, the city of Redlands has the, the Lincoln Shrine and Museum near their library. Um, it's based on the collection from the Smiley Brothers, who were two Civil War veterans who helped to found the city of Redlands right around this time. It was after, the, it was post-Civil War in the 1870s, 1880s. Um, and they have a substantial collection um, at the Lincoln Shrine. So it's in downtown Redlands, right across the green from uh, the city library, which is really an extraordinary library itself, but uh, very interesting Civil War history in the area. Um, and Tom, just, it fascinates me that Tom Vincent saw such serious combat. Um, the 8th Ohio, if you Google it, was in terrible battles, Antietam, Gettysburg, Cold Harbor, Wilderness. Um, and he, he was there for Pickett's Charge, um, if you Google it. So it's just extraordinary. And, and, and I think as Tom mentioned, uh, you wonder if he didn't have some kind of PTSD and just sort of knocked around the West and found a, a mountain home. He and millions of others. Yeah, I mean, it must have been very disturbing. You know, I always look at it and I think, why was the West so wild? Well, an awful lot of it was probably to do with the mental illness for the people who served and so, those who survived the uh, Civil War. It must have been horrendous for them. It really must. Right. There's um, a, new, a new question. Have you visited the nearby Stanley Miller mine? I haven't, no, I've never heard of it. Wow. Um, John Norvell posted it maybe john can unmute himself and tell us what, how to get to the stanley miller mine go on john <laughs> you know john no okay maybe john stepped away above the bridge to nowhere oh how oh. fun how fabulous okay above the bridge above the bridge to nowhere, to nowhere. Yeah. yeah oh that's that's way down there yeah yeah, that's the East Fork of the San Gabriel River. Yeah. Yep. So what was the name of that mine again? Stanley Miller Mine. Yeah. It's in the chat. Okay, great. Right. Oh, um, Marianne Ruiz, our chapter chair, just posted some very interesting mining-oriented information in the chat. Uh, there was a, also a recent article in the LA Times about this. Uh, there's a mining operation called Conglomerate Mesa that is um, planning a big mining operation near Death Valley through the National Park. And the Sierra Club is working with uh, some local tribal authorities um, oppose, to oppose the project. And if anyone's interested in helping to oppose it, uh, send Marianne Ruiz an, an email. And she's listed it in the chat. Good cause. Oh, here's another question. Have you written a book about Bighorn? Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, th I think the thing about it is that there are 
various posts. And in actual fact, I, I have to say this, I came across one uh, last night, I was given some information and if it could be posted, it's secret minds, secretminds.com stroke big dash horn dash mine html and it's it's got an awful lot of information about the big horn mine and what was really interesting about it is they've got they they, they were actually what they were responsible for trying to map the mine and in the end um they they got got the heck out of there and you'll see why it's all propped up there are rock falls things holding it together screwed into the wall it's really quite remarkable um and it's uh, there's also an area they're standing in which is like a, a big cavern and there's you can see there's been a rock fall and they're actually standing in it but i only found only came across that yesterday that information was given to me and it's really really interesting it's very very interesting yeah they're the ones who talk about there being 262,000 ounces of gold still in the mountain. And I, I was looking at it today, and gold is, uh, is at eight, uh, 1,860 ounces, dollars an ounce. Incredible. Uh, yeah, worth a lot more than in uh, Tom Vincent's day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. So it, you, no. sort of look, you look at it. If, I don't think my calculator will take that <laughs> to tell you actually how much it's worth. But hey, Norm, hmm. we have another yeah. question. Yeah. Um, how many mines are there or were there in the San Gabriel Mountains? And I'll, I'll tack my own question onto that. And how does that compare to the Big Bear San Bernardino Mountain area in terms right. of mines? Um, I don't think there are anywhere near as many mines in the, um, the San Gabriels as there were up in Big Bear. In fact, um, I think that's, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, the best thing to do is to go to uh, the John Robinson website and the uh, mines of the San Gabriel, and uh, that will tell you how many are in there um, because he does list them all in a map. And there are, there are plenty, but yeah, they're, they're few, few and far between when it comes to the uh, large size. Because what a lot of people were doing is they were doing placer mining. Um, in other words, they were panning and looking for gold without having to go dig it. That's what a lot of people were doing. And in fact, there was a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of uh, hydraulic mining that went on there, where they they uh, just crushed the rock with water, high pressure water, and they they used that when they had water available. So yeah. But yeah, John Robinson, the mines of the uh, San Gabriels. Fascinating. Any John Robinson book is good. Any other questions? Uh, there was one uh, prior, and maybe you can put in a plug for the the historical society norm. Someone wanted to know if any if there were any Wrightwood historians. Um, uh, that are colleagues of yours that were in attendance tonight. Can you tell everybody about the historical society that you belong to and, and kind of the, the local historians up in the area? Yeah, the Mojave Historical Society, they have a website, um, well worth joining, something like $30 a year. <clears throat> and they used to have meetings and they are, they've started doing uh, tours again into some really, really interesting places. Um, and there are plenty of those in and around the Mojave Desert. In Wrightwood, you have the Wrightwood Historical Society, and they have, a, they have a website too. Also, they have a really, really interesting museum in uh, that's well worth visiting in Wrightwood. You need to go online because I don't, I think it's only open like two days a week. Again, that's very interesting. And of course, they only open it in the summer because the winters are pretty bad up there. But yeah, if you it really, if, if you go to a, like you say, Lucerne Valley, okay, if you put Lucerne Valley Historical Society, their website will come up. 
Big Bear have got a historical society, uh, the Mojave Historical Society, Brightwood. You know, there's plenty of them. John, any further questions from your end? No, I don't see any any others listed in the chat section. Thanks, uh, Norman. Great talk. Lots of positive com comments in the chat section. <laughs> really fascinating. Yes, Norm, I certainly appreciate your hike savvy, your historical depth, and your detective skills. So. <laughs> <laughs> no detective sergeant bossom <laughs> thank you oh of course you're welcome thank you for the for the fascinating insights and great photography both you and your friends just did a splendid job bringing back the photographs of the site and and the historical photographs thank you for for finding those well i, 